In the 1800s, the United States had a president by the name of Abraham Lincoln. And uh, Abraham Lincoln was known for many things, not the least of which one of the presidents that was assassinated while in office. Following his death, Lincoln has been portrayed as a liberator of slaves, the savior of the Union, a martyr for the cause of freedom. He has been consistently considered one of the top three greatest presidents of the United States, if not the greatest, depending on who you ask. In the 1900s, across the globe, a man with a different reputation in a different country was a man by the name of Vladimir Lenin. Lenin was a Russian revolutionary and a politician. He was the founder of the Russian Communist Party. He served as the first and founding head of the government of the Soviet Russia at 1917, which became the Soviet Union in 1922. He died two years later. Lenin has had a profound impact on the course of world history, inspiring revolutionary movements across the globe, including ushering in his disciple of sorts, Stalin, who came to power after Lenin's death. Under Stalin's leadership, led to the death of no less than 9 million Russian citizens. Later in the 1900s in India, you have a man by the name of Mahatdans, Gandhi. Gandhi, originally a lawyer, became an anti-colonial nationalist and a political ethicist. He led a non-violent protest against the occupation of India by the British rule, and he was successful in doing so. When he died on January 30th, 1948, at the age of 78, an estimated 2 million people attended his funeral. The truth is, people die all the time. Most of them die unknown to everybody except their own family, perhaps a few friends. But some of them, relatively small by comparison of human history's population, are well known for what they did in their lifetime, for good or bad. And that notoriety is seen at what happens either at their funeral or in the days that follow. Not long ago, in 2022, in September 8th, the United Kingdom stopped and observed the passing of their queen. At the age of 96, Queen Elizabeth II was the longest reigning monarch of anyone in British history. Representatives from 168 countries, including 10, 18 other monarchs, 55 presidents, and 25 prime ministers were in attendance. But here's the reality when such people die. Life goes on. It just continues. If I asked you today personally, how has your life been affected by the death of Abraham Lincoln? You would say, some of you, who? Lenin, you would say, no, thank you. Gandhi, you'd say, oh, an example in different ways. Queen Elizabeth, I don't know, perhaps you're caught up in the American romance of British monarchy and want to talk about that. But most of you today would be like, not really impacting me, no real effect on me. Well, this begs the question, then why would the death of a Jewish man, a rabbi, a teacher, 2,000 years ago, not, not 100 years ago, not 50 years ago, 2,000 years ago, why would that have any different impact on your or my life today? Why does that change anything? People die all the time. Why should a death 2,000 years ago have any different type of impact? Well, I'll tell you why. Because three days after he died, he got up and he walked out of the tomb. Nobody has ever claimed that or even been able to prove that. 
Nobody. Now, consider, if you will, history. On March 15th, 44 BC, dozens of Roman senators assassinated Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was a Roman general and a statesman. He led the Roman uh, through the Gallic Wars and eventually became the dictator for at least five years until he was assassinated by his senators. You, you know who doubts that? No one. No one doubts that. It's historical proof. But do you know that the historical proof for that historical fact, of which it is, is small by comparison of records and witnesses to the actual historical fact of the life, the death, and the resurrection of of Jesus of Nazareth. It is an overwhelming fact. And the question is, while this might be true, how does the resurrection of Jesus 2,000 years ago matter to you and me in Miami in 2024? Is it just a sentimental thing? A chance for us to get dressed up? Put on spring colors? Have some special baked goods? Hang out with family longer than we maybe normally would? Oh, friends, so much more than that because the resurrection of Jesus changes everything for everyone whether they come to realize it or not. So mark my words. No matter where you are and what you think of Jesus, lived or not, died or not, resurrected or not, it does not matter what you think. It matters what is true. And that truth has a ripple effect through all of history, before then and certainly after then. Here's the main thing I want you to understand. The resurrection of Jesus is confirmation of his identity and invitation to find hope in him. This is a a time where people present themselves to be someone who have done something. We have this, right? We have resumes. We apply for a job. People want to know, where have you been before here? Did you go to school? Tell us about it. How well did you do? Did you work any other place? Where? For how long? Who could we call? People want to know references. Even in the idea of someone dating somebody else. They're like, does anybody else know you that I could maybe meet one day sooner or later? With the intention that I would like to find out from them is what I think about you is what is true. But today's age, we've become rather skeptical, rather cynical. Why? Because we're used to everybody from politicians to celebrities and the like claiming to be something by which they are not. Things that they claim to have accomplished, people they claim to be related to, and they're not. They're proven to be a scandal. When we find out that they are not telling the truth, they are exposed for deceit. They are rejected as a liar. We even see this with major academic institutions where people are claiming to have written things that they thought of. The truth is they are just copying somebody else. Jesus makes some claims that are pretty outlandish. John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, Jesus says, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. Here's the thing. He didn't lie. He said it, and then he went ahead and did it. I mean, we can say one thing, but doing it's a whole other thing. You can make all kinds of claims, but Jesus made a claim and then proved it. For those of you who have never surrendered your life to Christ, do not understand him to be the Savior or know him to claim as such, but have not surrendered your life accordingly to him, wanting to go about it a different way. This has huge implications for you, even if you reject him. Because here's why. Jesus' resurrection means that Jesus was not just of man like you and I, he is from God. That Jesus of Nazareth is indeed the Son of God. And it makes all his other claims 
incredible. Consider some of the claims, encouraging claims and some concerning claims. Encouraging, Matthew 11, verse 28, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Oh, do so many of us need to hear that? Do so many of us need to know that there is somebody who can help us? Jesus says, I can. He also claims in John chapter 7, verse 37, that he just says, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He's referring to the fact that he gives living water, that you'll never thirst again. This is exactly what he tells the woman at the well. That's encouraging. But you know what also is concerning? Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Friends, the reason we should be very concerned about the teachings of Jesus, especially for those who have not surrendered their life to Jesus, is because all his claims are true. Not only about his person, his identity, he is God. Not only about his invitation, which is that he extends himself to everyone here, but also his rejection for those who trust in anyone other than Christ. For those of you, and many of you are in Christ, your faith is in him. You too can be encouraged by the resurrection. I mean, just consider 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Listen to what Paul tells the Christians there in 1 Corinthians 15. He says in verses 52 to 58, he says, For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, that we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Oh, for those of us who are in Christ, I mean, honestly, you can say with all humility to the world, to life, to all circumstances yet to come, bring it. Bring it. I'm not worried. The worst you can do is kill me. I remember what Paul says, absent from the, absent from the body, present with the Lord. I don't want death. I'm not praying for disease. I don't want difficulty in my life. I'm not some sucker for pain. But I am not worried that seemingly the greatest thing that others would fear, I do not fear. For in the same way we heard on Friday night, for those of us who are here for Good Friday service, we hear the echo as Jesus said to that thief on the cross who believed in him, today you will be with me in paradise. Oh, friends, that's all because the tomb is empty. Death died when Jesus died and then rose from the grave. Friends, this is remarkable. It gives us an invitation to constantly be in a state of hope. To see that, I want us to turn our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 is where we begin to slow it down from the plethora of scriptures we've considered briefly to now let's give it some time and marinate with these a little bit more enduringly. As we give our attention to 1 Peter, for those of you not familiar with 
the Bible, not familiar with this letter of 1 Peter. This is the infamous Peter. Oh, man. This guy's got quite a biography. Peter, who's brought by his brother to meet Jesus for the first time. Peter, who kind of becomes really a leader amongst other disciples, often leading the wrong direction, saying the wrong things. Sometimes he gets it so right. Jesus, you are the son of the living God. And sometimes he gets it so wrong. Denying Jesus as a follower of his, not once, not twice, but three times. And yet God's grace is seen in Jesus, even as he meets him after his resurrection and comes to him and even calls upon him, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? This repeating question keeps asking him and Peter says, Lord, you know that I love you. Just feed my sheep. Peter goes on to live. Not perfectly. Oh, you read the book of Galatians? He messes up again. He goes back into hypocrisy. Paul's got to have a moment with Peter. It's not private. No, it's public. Because Peter's leading people into hypocrisy, undermining the clarity of the gospel that we're saved not by what we eat or don't eat, do or don't do. We're saved by faith in Christ. And he's confusing that message by the actions he's taking, the people he's separating himself from. And Paul's like, Peter... Let's have a conversation. The rest of you, listen up. Barnabas, especially you. But Peter, like so many of us, keeps coming back by God's grace to the reality of what is true. And in 1 Peter, he writes to these Christians who are scattered. They're going through hard times. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. And then in the beginning of chapter one, he introduces something that we'll see for our purposes this morning, really will continue throughout the next five chapters of 1 Peter. What I want us to see here is how the resurrection teaches us about hope. And Christians, I hope this will encourage you, how the resurrection teaches you about hope. The first thing Peter says is that our hope is a confident victory. Look at verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. That's the qualification, not what we've done, his mercy. He has caused us to be born again. There's nothing we did ourselves. He did it in us. To what? To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is a confident victory. They, it, notice what he says here, this description of a living hope. It's not like a superstitious hope, not like a fingers crossed hope. It's not like a historical one, a sentimental one, a family one. It is alive today as you and I are sitting are, are standing here before each other. Uh, some of you know this. Others of you are clueless about this. There's a basketball tournament going on called March Madness. Happens every year. It's called March Madness, I think, because some people lose their minds cheering for certain college teams. I always find it interesting, whether it be in football or basketball or baseball, whatever the sport is, to let a bunch of grown adults have their days ruined by a bunch of 18 and 19-year-olds. I don't quite understand it, but it's common nationwide. How well they do or don't do determines how well I'm going to feel or not feel. Teams are going on, they're playing. One of the teams that's still in the competition is UConn. UConn, for those of you who don't know, stands for University of Connecticut. UConn played their first game in the March Madness and beat the team that they played by 39 points. 39 points. That's not a buzzer beater, friends. That's like varsity basketball against some, like, Small elementary school. And I mean no disrespect to that team who made it. 39 points. 
But then the next game that they played, they beat that team by 17 points. The next team by 30 points. And then they beat the team recently by 25 points. This isn't like they had like one crazy one and then they're like, you know, everyone else has been kind of close. It's like, I don't even know it to know if this is true, but I got to imagine they're like, okay, second string, okay, third string. Anybody want to, anybody in the stands want to play with us? Anybody? Now, obviously, I don't mean to sound disrespectful, but it's remarkable how they consistently keep destroying their opponents. And you can imagine if you're a fan of UConn, there might be some of you in the room this morning, some of you are maybe arch enemies of UConn, like, I can't believe you're talking about UConn. I hope they lose. But you got to imagine if you're a fan of UConn, you're hoping that they're going to go all the way. They have one, maybe two more games to see if they're going to win it. But you know what they're doing right now? They're crossing their fingers. They're close. I hope they're going to make it. But you got teams like Duke who are like, we're coming for you. Alabama's like UConn, it's on. You just don't know. But you know what's true for every Christian? We know. We know we're not crossing our fingers. We're not hoping. We're not wringing our hands. Jesus is alive. He won. Victory is secure. This is why, for example, when we sing, we're not like, wow, these people like to go public. It's because we're so confident that what we sing is not just poetically beautiful and melodious and wonderful and instrumentally presented so well and the singers are great and the instrumentalists are great. It's because we actually believe it. We believe it. Some of us are like trying to exercise self-control when we sing because we don't want to distract others around us, but we're like losing our minds. At least that's what's going up there when I'm waiting to be baptizing people. Hope springs eternal. Peter here in 1 Peter 3 says, God has called us to be, God has caused us to be born again to a living hope. But that hope, look, it's like through the pathway, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Friends, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus didn't rise, there's no hope. Like, go home. Don't be here. You got dressed up for nothing. You shouldn't be here. You should be somewhere out there. I don't know, a place of your choosing, still in bed at the beach, running errands, whatever. Just don't be here. But friends, if he is indeed alive, there's no better place to be than right here. Responding, worshiping, inviting, praying, loving, championing the reality that we have a living, ongoing hope. Secondly, how the resurrection teaches us about hope. Verses 4 through 5, our hope comes with an inheritance. As if it couldn't get any better. Look at verse 4. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Oh, friends, this is radical because what he's saying is, hey, God has something for you and it's a sure thing. No one can change it. No one can affect it. No one can in any way influence it, take it, reduce its value. Some of you, maybe lots of you have responsibly, either at a young age or at an older age, you've been investing in your retirement accounts. Roth, IRAs, and the like, mutual funds and other ways in which you're investing. And you're putting money aside responsibly each month, each year, and so much as you have money to do so because you want to not presume on your future that you will always have the physical capacity to provide for yourself. Not everybody here is able to do that, but many of you are. Some of you are probably people who check how that account is doing regularly. You're wondering what the rate of return was last year, and the year before, and the three month, and the one month, and the today. And you're concerned. And we have enough things that's happened in our country that just sort of shows like, man, up and down and up and down. We have this sort of new wave of technological boom right now with artificial intelligence. People trying to figure out where to invest in that. Want to have a sure thing. Because what if I invest with a startup company that turns out to be a bust, not a boom? Friends, investing your life in Christ is always a boom. 
Because you receive an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. This sort of continued cascading descriptions of it. Kept in heaven for you, who is who by God's power, referring to the people, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In other words, let me be very clear, friends. For some of you who come from a tradition that teaches otherwise, let me politely correct it. You cannot lose your salvation. If you could, you would. But your salvation is not dependent upon you doing enough good things to somehow secure it. That God's like, all right, all right. You deserve the payout, the dividend at the end. Guard, God is guarding, God is protecting for you what he secured and he gives to you. Oh my goodness, that gives us hope for the future. The third thing about our hope we see here is not only our hope is a confident victory, our hope comes with an inheritance. Third, our hope is during suffering and trials. Look at verse six and seven. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, You have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What I I love about the Bible is how honest it is. Like, if I'm Peter... I'm going to ask my friends, John and Matthew, hey, could you take out the denial part? I'm going to talk to Paul. Can we just skip over the whole, like, I separated from the Greeks part? No, the Bible just tells it as it is. Straight up honest truth. I I think that's what makes it shocking for so many skeptics and critics is because People would believe something if they simply could benefit from it. And by benefit, they typically mean by some type of ease or prosperity. But God tells the truth in a surprising way. That giving your life to Christ does not mean from that point on, your life becomes and will continue to be until you die easy. We still live in a fallen world, friends. It is not the world that God created when he first declared it good. We still live in a world that is against God and its very presuppositional beliefs. We have an active devil that's like a roaring lion, Peter would later say to 1 Peter, seeking those whom he may devour. And as if that's not bad enough, we still have an internal problem. What Paul calls the flesh that keeps just tapping us on the shoulder. Hey, look at her. Hey, look at him. Hey, you deserve this. Hey, you should buy this. Hey, you have a right to be bitter. Hey, you should be slandering. Hey, you know, it's not called gossip. It's called discernment. And just on and on and on it goes. And then as if that wasn't bad enough, even if you seemingly do it all right, you would say no to those temptations. That does not mean that you still don't experience difficulty in trial. Just ask the Christians in 1 Peter, who there, for their thankfulness for obeying the Lord, they got kicked out of their houses. May I remind you, verse one, exiles. Exiles is not the name of some Christian gang. Exiles are people who are exiled. They are refugees. They are on the run for being persecuted as Christians. And he goes on in chapter two and chapter four and says this. Why is this so important? It's important because I think it's honestly truth and advertising of which we seemingly could benefit a lot more from today. Coming to Christ and finding in his resurrection a living hope is to do so even as many of us walk at different stages in time through a hall of darkness and difficulty. He says, I see you. I'm with you, and what you're going through right now is not the only thing I have for you. So many of you just need a word of hope to get you through today, to make it to tomorrow. There's no pep talk I can give you that would sustain you. No poster we can put on your bedroom wall that is good enough. The only true abiding reality is that the tomb is empty. 
so that when that man who is now risen and reigning as the God man, when he makes a promise to you, which he does to all those who put their faith in him, he says, I see you, I will never forget you, I will never abandon you, and I will always be with you. And what I have for you will make this temporary world with all of its afflictions momentary. Light. Small. By comparison of the glory to come in Christ. How honest and hopeful is that? God sees, God cares, and God promises a future to come. Fourth and final, our hope is in the one who will save our souls. Look at what he says to the Christians in verse 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Why? Verse 9, obtaining the outcome of your faith. What happens because of your faith? The salvation of your souls. Friends, our greatest problem is not the political landscape we find ourselves in the United States, as jacked up as it looks. Your greatest problem is not the current state of economic affairs you are personally in by the debt that's overwhelming you or the fact that the city gets increasingly more expensive and how can we continue to live here? It's not in the fact that you thought you had a good friend until they stabbed you in the back. And your problem is you just need a friend you can trust it. Your biggest problem is my biggest problem. What's going to happen with my soul? Who is going to save me and preserve my soul for an eternity? I love what it says here in the text as it points that answer to Jesus. I love what he says here in verse 8. Notice how he says, though you have not seen him, and then right after that, though you do not yet see him, but look at the sequence, you love him. And then he says, you believe in him. Now, logically, it would seemingly make sense to say, well, you believe in him, and then knowing him, you then love him. That's how my mind would work. You cannot love what you do not know. That's a common relational understanding. But I, I love what's happening here in the text to recognize the significance here is to understand what Peter feels in his heart, they get as well. They love the one whom they have not seen with their eyes, but they believe on in their hearts because he's not only historically real, but he's presently reigning and promises to return for them. They love him not only for who he is, but for what he has done, is doing, and will do in their life in the years to come. They love him. That is the most fundamental question you can ask anybody who professes to be a Christian, it's this, do you love Jesus? I'm not simply asking you, do you know Jesus? I'm not even asking you, do you know about Jesus? I'm asking, do you love Jesus? Do you love him and give your life to him? Many people don't mind Jesus as a role model a good teacher that we should listen to more to his teachings and do a better job following his example, but they don't want to put their hope in him for the forgiveness of their sins. They either want to deny they have a problem to begin with, or they want to try to deal with their problems their own way, but first by just seemingly being better people. You know, like, you can do better, try better, do more. A little less bitter, a little bit more forgiving, a little bit happier. As if we're all in this sort of explorative self-improvement project. Peter says in verse 9, No, friends, you have a bigger concern. It's the outcome of your souls. And that hope is in Jesus and his resurrection. So who are you going to trust in? Who are you going to delight in? Christians, can I just encourage you? 
Please don't ever get bored with the gospel. Please don't think of the gospel as just something for those who don't know Christ. Friends, it is something to go back to all the time. My wife, Danelle, and I have been married for 27 years. We got married on August 10th, 1996. August 10th is our wedding anniversary. When our anniversary comes along, we do something special. You know what I do not do? I do not wait until another year to do something special with my wife. I do not wait until another year to say to my wife, honey, thank you for marrying me. I love you. And if you doubt that, wait until next year. I will tell you then, and I will mean it. I know I'll just need like a little bridge moment, like, you know, Valentine's Day. Oh, honey, here's some flowers. Here's a card. No, no, I, I enjoy loving my wife, even simply when there's no calendared reason to do so. Not her birthday, not her anniversary, not Valentine's. It's just simply because, well, it's her. You know what I'm going to be doing tomorrow night? I'm taking her on a date. You know where I'm going? Chewy's, Tex-Mex restaurant up in Broward. Gentlemen, that's called living with your wife in an understanding way. Chewy's is like her Ruth's Chris. It's her steakhouse. And I will gladly take her there tomorrow night. I enjoy my wife over the days, throughout the weeks, because it's not the occasion I'm celebrating, it's the person. Christians, you don't need Easter to celebrate Jesus. You don't even need Sunday and a worship service to celebrate Jesus. You just need life. You need to be in the middle of the darkness or the victory, the loss or or the success. In all seasons, in all situations, you can rejoice in Christ. Don't take my word for it. Listen to Paul. He's in prison in Philippians like, hey, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice in the Lord. This is an opportunity for us Christians to be reminded. It's not simply what we'll sing and celebrate today. It's also what we'll live and declare our love for tomorrow. Easter will come and go as an annual celebration. The date moves on the calendar accordingly to when the church historically celebrates it. But the reality is nothing has changed for us as Christians. It's in whom we find our identity, our relationship to one another, our hope for tomorrow, and the reason we continue to live no matter what comes. Like it or not, friends, to everybody in this room, Easter, Resurrection Sunday, has changed everything. Sunday that Jesus came back to life, rewrote history. It was promised, and it came to pass. The world has never been the same since And the world to come is being judged based upon that historical reaction of their belief in or the rejection of. And he promises, he promises all those whose faith is in him alone for the forgiveness of their sins, not the world's sins, not the country's sins, not their family's sins, just theirs, that they will be raised as well unto eternal life. 